Hey money makers, I'm Kalila Reynolds and welcome to Taking Stock. I hope you're ready for an exciting show because you guys have been asking me to do today's topic for a while now. Sit back, grab some snacks and oh yeah, are you subscribed to my newsletter yet? Go to kalilareynolds.com. What are you waiting for? I'll even give you five seconds. All right, did you do it? All right, now come on, let's get this money. First up, cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum have become the latest rage among eager investors. But what makes this such a hot topic among investors worldwide? Is this a worthwhile investment or just hype? It was around seven hundred dollars for one. Fifty-six thousand today difference that we're looking to bring to Jamaica is that ecosystem. And later the analysts swing on the latest market developments. What do they think about the crypto market? But what makes cryptocurrency unique in, is that they have an underlying technology which is a blockchain and there are applications that are sometimes built on top of these blockchain um, frameworks. The Trinidad-based Guardian Holdings is listing by introduction on the Jamaica Stock Exchange this week. How are investors reacting? Certainly, it's an opportunity for them to, I guess, open up the company to more shareholders. You probably might see GHL raise equity here in Jamaica, and you probably might see potentially a stock split to make it more conformity to number of investors. We'll discuss. But first, here's What's Hot, brought to you by Jamaica Money Market Brokers, your best interest at heart. Supreme Ventures Limited SVL now has a 10% stake in Main Event Entertainment Group. SVL says the move is aligned with its growth and expansion strategy. Executive Chairman Gary Peart says the acquisition will enable SVL to better leverage its entertainment brand to serve a wider cross-section of customers with products, that are aligned to their evolving needs. After recording three consecutive quarterly losses, Main Event Entertainment generated a net profit of $8.1 million between November and January. The event management, production, promotions, and digital signage company has been listed on the Junior Stock Exchange since 2017. Holders of bonds listed on the new Jamaica Stock Exchange private market are to benefit from lower taxes, Finance Minister Dr. Nigel Clark says his ministry is revising the treatment of withholding tax on interest payments to bondholders. This means the companies making these interest payments will have less taxes to worry about. In the meantime, the ministry has approved five foreign assets in which intermediaries such as securities dealers or pension funds will be allowed to invest as of April 30. These include corporate foreign currency debt instruments publicly traded foreign currency shares of companies incorporated in and outside of Jamaica, and Bank of Jamaica foreign currency certificates of deposit. Caribbean Information and Credit Rating Services, Caricris, now has a Jamaica office. The office is in the Panjam building in New Kingston. It's the agency's first office outside of their Trinidad and Tobago headquarters in 16 years of operations. CEO of Caricris, Wayne Das, said the office is being opened now due to more demand for independent credit ratings. He says it also comes as the Jamaican government modernizes financial sector laws, which call for more transparency and price discovery in the local market. Rio has reopened two more of its properties in Jamaica. The Rio Palace Tropical Bay in Negril and Rio Reggae in Montego Bay started welcoming visitors last weekend. All Rio properties in Jamaica were closed the last year due to COVID-19. The Spanish hotel chain said all visitors from countries that require a negative antibody test before returning home will be able to get the test for free. It said visitors would also have the option of a PCR test. Rio Hotel and Resorts operates six properties in Jamaica. Rio Negril is the only one still not open. Goodyear Jamaica says it will be making a final payment of 63 cents per share to shareholders on record as at December 19, 2008. The payment is expected to be made on May 21, but is subject to 4% transfer tax. The former tire manufacturing company has been in voluntary liquidation since 2008, two years after a fire destroyed its inventory. The company never fully recovered. 
When the liquidation was announced, Jamaican shareholders were told to expect compensation of at least 80 cents on the dollar for assets liquidated after debt repayments. The company is still having challenges locating some eligible shareholders. Barita's two new locations in New Kingston and Montego Bay could be up and running as soon as this month. The locations are now being outfitted. They will house the firm's new divisions, team members, and cater to new customers. Barita is said to also be exploring more locations and deal-making businesses. For the half-year ending March 2021, Barita recorded a 104% jump in net profits. The company made $2.06 billion in those six months. What's Hot was brought to you by Jamaica Money Market Brokers, your best interest at heart. And when we come back, is cryptocurrency a safe investment? Hey, money makers, you're not an official part of the family until you have your merch. Visit KhalilaReynolds.com slash store to order your t-shirt and your mask today. Let's get this money. This segment of Taking Stock is brought to you by Bulwark Insurance Agency. Insurance made easy. And Massey United Insurance. How good is your insurance? Welcome back to Taking Stock. Unless you've been living under a rock for the past year, you've probably heard of cryptocurrencies and especially Bitcoin. This time last year, one Bitcoin was worth about 8,000 US dollars. Today, it's trading at nearly 57,000 US dollars for one, you know, one decade, decade Bitcoin. That's 8.7 million Jamaican dollars. Just two Bitcoins could literally buy you a house in Jamaica, not in Kingston though, but somewhere, you know, out in rural Jamaica. And then there are other coins gaining popularity as well, such as Ethereum and Dogecoin. So could this be a good investment for you? Joining me now, we have CEO of Caracoin, Karsten Becker, CEO of E. Chapman Group, Toronto Earl Chapman, and manager of bond trading, equity, and stockbroking at Victoria Mutual Wealth Management, Denise Marshall Miller. So, hi guys. Hi, Karsten, Denise, Earl. It's great to have you on for this very sexy topic. Hi, Salida. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Everybody's Hello. interested in cryptocurrency right now. Everybody wants to know, how can I do it here from Jamaica? And I had, I did an episode on it recently on Money Mondays, JA, and we're going to get to some of the challenges with uh, trading from the region. But first, let me start with Karsten, because I interviewed you about five years ago in 2016 when you were launching Caracoin here in Jamaica. And you promised me some, some Bitcoin if I opened a wallet with you and I foolishly didn't <laughs> take it <laughs> at the time. How much, was, how much was Bitcoin trading at that time? Uh, it was around $700 for one. Wow. Oh. Wow. It's a 56,000 $56, today. You lost that trade. <laughs> I didn't do it. I didn't 56, do it. 56,000 today. Man. Oh, yeah. I kick myself every time I think about that. Yeah, Should have listened to you at the time. But, but tell us what happened because I remember there was a lot of press around Caracoin at the time. And since then, it kind of faded. I didn't hear anything else about the platform. Yeah, we basically got blocked by the BOJ. We wanted to build a platform that would be open, that would be, you know, that anyone would have access to. We piloted it, it worked great. Um, we got great feedback. And um, we needed, of course, bank integration in the Caribbean to make it easy for people to actually use Jamaica dollars. And we went to the BOJ and they basically um, blocked us, shut us down. They issued a notice saying that um, without a license, um, we are pretty much forbidden to trade. So we decided um, you know, to, to wait for a license, probably take quite a while. They still don't have a license. so. Um, we focused instead on the African markets and under a different brand. We kept Caracoin going as a source of truth and a place where people can, you know, refer to the price of Bitcoin, learn about Bitcoin. We got lots of guides, um, lots of functionality there for people who want to get up and running. And we are going to be relaunching a merchant service in, in a couple of weeks, actually, through the site. So merchants can start to earn cryptocurrency. Yeah, so you did apply for the license and it just never it never happened? What happened? You just gave up on it? 
Well, we, we spoke to the BOJ and they were quite adamant. We met with them a few times and they actually issued a press release which came out in the newspaper saying, we love what they're doing, but without a license, they can't do anything. So we tried um, to push it along, but realized it was futile. Um, and, you know, realized that there's other markets. So we went to, we focused on, on Europe, Africa. And now here we are five years later and everybody wants in on cryptocurrency. I see VM, you guys, are you the only ones who are doing it right now in Jamaica legally that you can go to and sign up and, and get through? Denise? Well, we're, we're not fully at that um, place. We are working with our regulators and we are waiting um, approval um to to start to offer this to our clients in a very in an ecosystem that is safe they're able to trade and to settle their their cryptocurrencies but we are not fully there yet we are working with the regulators as soon as we have received this approval then we will commence and how long do you expect before that could be i'm i'm thinking this could be with within um I would say the latest, the third quarter of this year. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So right now you're driving awareness that this is yes. coming and it's something that you're interested in. We'll come back to you shortly. Earl, tell yes, me sure. about your experience. I, I know you have a lot of knowledge on this topic. Tell me what has brought you to being interested and invested in this area. First and foremost, thank you. Um, my background allowed me to see demographic shifts in technology and the world. Uh, coming from building all the internet service providers for Bell Canada from zero to 55 million, then running carrier services and bringing AT&T and AOL into Canada. Then also building out these internet service providers into telephone companies like Primus and Group Telecom. Um, these companies who were internet service providers became certified local exchange carriers, which is a license again you achieve and then you can become a telephone company. And then also building two cows, which is domain registration to allow you to basically um, be on the um, web and have an email address, et cetera, have a website, et cetera. And if, any, if anyone recalls back in the day, it was $120 for a domain name. Now I'm sort of aging myself, but it was <laughs> $120 for a domain name. And now it's very cheap to get an email address or website up. So, Recognizing blockchain was that next step to enhance the internet environment. I got involved about five years ago, yeah, right, six years ago, and just really monitored and watched and participated in certain uh, deals. I recognized that it would be tremendous value to bring it to Jamaica where the Jamaican Stock Exchange can create a regulated digital asset exchange. And that's what we've done for over the past three years um, successfully. I should say, with the help of the FSC, um, BOJ, so we spent um, quite a lot of time in front of the BOJ's risk management team to assess that we were providing a software platform to a stock exchange to allow the buying and selling of crypto. So, so what's your platform called? That That's a company called Blockstation. I worked closely with them. I recruited them to come to Jamaica after having brought a couple of other companies to Jamaica to present to the Jamaican Stock Exchange the opportunity to build an exchange. And what really prompted me to looking at the exchange is that if you go to a website called coinmarketcap.com and you take a look at exchanges that are buying and selling crypto, none of them are regulated, mm -hmm. right? And they are eventually going to be regulated because they're a you know, version of the stock exchange. But again, they're trading crypto. No, no, so actually, I believe it's they're, they're all regulated now. They're all regulated? Yeah, there's heavy regulations in the market right now. Without regulations, um, the market wouldn't really have exploded as it's done recently. So it depends on your jurisdiction, but um, mm -hmm. right. markets, you need licenses. So you need a license in every state in America. In yep. Canada, you can get a money handler's license. Europe right. has a, um, a crypto registration. Singapore has licenses. I mean, there's certain jurisdictions that don't have licenses, but um, right. pretty much heavy regulation is now in place. So this has been helping the market to grow. Yeah, and, and, that, and that's a very and that's a very good point you made because you're correct. 
individual countries and states in the U.S. have stepped up to say, hey, you know, if you're offering this service, we need to have you rein in and follow our rules. But what I'm driving at is that there's never been uh, a regulated exchange like the JSC, a name brand, let's put it that way, that allows institutions and other players to feel a lot more comfortable with the measures that the JSC has as governance. So I think we're, I think the JSC and what we've accomplished will continue to enjoy what you just pointed out that's been a, a growth. So, so people can, you can sign up with, that's what I was about to ask Carson. So people can sign up with Blockstation right now and trade crypto from Jamaica? No. No, no, no. no. Again, Blockstation, is a software platform that enhances an exchange, a, a regular stock exchange, to buy and sell crypto. So can you buy crypto on the Jamaica Stock Exchange? Well, I think Denise alluded to that. What we built, what, what we built in Jamaica was the whole process of being able to come to a broker dealer, hence VM being on the call, to then open up an account like you would do with a normal transaction and then be able to sort of buy and sell whatever we've decided to put out there. But still not live. So still not live, still not available to the public. So you're working with VM. Yeah, it's pretty pretty close, pretty close. Um, the the process or to buy it will be done via broker, and mm -hmm. uh, which would take place mm -hmm. on the stock exchange, which is powered by Blocks, Blockstation's platform. Yeah. But we're not fully there, but it's it's very close. A lot of work, as Earl noted, for the past three years um, has been put in. We're actually at the final stage at this time. Yeah. So this is the challenge that we are having. So there is so much interest because of the explosion in the past year or so. There's so much interest in investing in cryptocurrency, trading cryptocurrency. So I asked my team to, to do some research on it a few weeks ago, and we did an episode about it. We came up with you know the, the some of the big names out there through which you can trade cryptocurrencies if you're in another country. Because apparently the, the challenge that my followers have been having and the feedback we got after we aired that was that, well, when we sign up with these websites and we have our, our wallet, we are unable to transfer funds from our Jamaican accounts to, to, to fund the wallet because the local banks are blocking the transaction, I guess, because it's seen as high risk. I don't know why, but what's the experience with, with how it's happening now, Denise? Well, well, as I noted, VM has not started, but also being in the in the space and following exactly what is happening. A method that a lot of persons here in Jamaica are using is to use their credit card, mm -hmm. go onto these exchanges <laughs> and to make their purchases. Yeah. The difference and- The and, fees and the, are higher when you use your credit card, right? That is, <laughs> that, it, that, is, that is the case. But the difference that we're looking to bring to Jamaica is that ecosystem. So, you know, there's the whole risk of your wallet being stolen, the hacking, etc. What the system that we're looking to, um, to bring to the market here in Jamaica via the Jamaica Stock Exchange is eco in the sense that the trading, the settlement is done seamlessly and mm -hmm. also the storage Mm -hmm. of your, your cryptocurrency is very important and that insurance that is aligned to it. So mm -hmm. that is the main difference that we're bringing to the market. So there are several exchanges out there mm -hmm. that you could go on. There's, of course, mm -hmm. Coinbase just did a direct listing. You have Binance and so many others, Bitstamp, etc. But the there are other in, um, situations, the concerns. With everything, there are risk. But a main challenge for Jamaicans, as you noted, is having that transfer, which mm -hmm. is oftentimes blocked, but a workaround that I've seen a lot of persons, investors <laughs> utilizing <laughs> is the credit card. Mm -hmm. Who's laughing? Is that me, Earl? It's, a, it's, a, good laughing, Earl? it's a good workaround, and BOJ can't do anything about it. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> 
So, but, all right. So let's talk about the risk, because like we said, this is all the rage right now, but there are still a lot of people who are concerned and people in regulatory authorities here, which is probably why they've been blocking the transfers, are still concerned about how safe it is or how risky it is to invest in cryptocurrency. Karsten, what's your take on that? So I'd say like all markets, um, value of cryptocurrencies can increase and decrease over time. So if you're a day trader, a lot of people are day traders looking to make a quick buck, then there is there is a lot of volatility. So it's probably not the best market to be in un unless you're very savvy. But mm -hmm. um, if you're looking at it as a long-term investment, then for I would say from personal experience, it's probably the best place to put your money. I mean, we've seen the market go from a couple million dollars five years ago to over two billion dollars, sorry, two trillion dollars as of today, right? I mean, yeah. anybody who invested in any crypto at all last year, the year before, the year before that yeah. would have made, made a lot of money. And um, this is not a fad or a surge. You have 30% of, of Bitcoin, for instance, is owned by banks and large um, financial institutions. So they're pre preventing the crash in value that we've seen before, right? Um, and there's also some amazing technology coming out, um, which is moving a lot of other financial services onto into crypto markets. So you have no insurance on the blockchain. You can even get up to 10% insure, um, 10% interest if you lock up cryptocurrencies in a wallet for a period of time. So you got interest, you got insurance, you got so many new ways to the, the ecosystem is growing that mm -hmm. this is going to continue to drive value uh, as we continue to, um, to to take over traditional systems. So Earl, uh, mm -hmm. what has been driving this explosion in the past year? Uh, in terms of industry, the overall? The, well, the, the, uh, the rapid appreciation in Bitcoin, for example, all the new coins that are coming out, yeah. all its interests, what's behind that? I think Costin said it really clearly. Um, you got the banks owning, you got everyone now involved. So um, you should have taken them up on the five year offer ago, five years ago when he offered you some Bitcoin. Yeah. <laughs> because... majority, majority, right? The markets are maturing like never before, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It, still sounded, it still sounded a bit iffy at the time to me. I mean, even the term cryptocurrency, crypto kind of sounds a little, ooh, what is that? Um, <laughs> you, know? you, you must be able to spot the diamond, um, Kalida. But yeah. as, 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 as both gentlemen said, with institutions coming on board, some of the popular names that you know, consumer, payment companies, PayPal, um, et cetera, yeah. are yeah. Embracing cryptocurrency, more and more you're finding um, investors that are coming to the market. So maybe in 2017, what you saw was mostly retail investors. Over the last year, a lot of institutional positions have been taken into cryptocurrency, particularly Bitcoin. And as a result, you're seeing that um, appreciation in the price, the interest um, is is coming into this emerging asset class. Yeah, I saw Elon Musk tweet to us yes. a couple of days ago that he's the dog, dog how do you pronounce it? Dogecoin, dog, dog, dog yes. and that uh -huh. sent the, the value of <laughs> Dogecoin soaring. But yep. so how do I even know which one to pick? Because there's so many of them now. There's Dogecoin, Ethereum, Bitcoin, so many. Is it too late, for example, Karsten, to get in on Bitcoin with a value of fifty-two thousand dollars? Like it seems no, like you missed the boat on it. No. With the institutional money going into Bitcoin, it will probably drive it all the way up to a million. Right? This Whoa. is where yeah. the market yeah. most likely end up. It may not be um, this month or next month, but I would say in another four to five years, if we had this call again, I would expect it to be somewhere around that price point. So it's not too late. Um, you know, all the anything other than Bitcoin, which is held by um, institutional investors, hedge funds own a lot of Bitcoin, is really a lot more skeptical, right? So um, you never know what's going to drive the price up and down. But second yeah. to Bitcoin, Ethereum is powering the smart contract revolution and um, a whole new market of what we call decentralized finance. So Ethereum is 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 going to follow Bitcoin because while it doesn't have the institutional money behind it. 
it has this whole world of amazing technology where you can do peer-to-peer -peer loans, peer-to-peer -peer insurance policies, um, peer-to-peer trading. It cuts out the middleman. Um, and this is actually a big deal because it removes all the costs the middleman brings. And this was one of the prime you know, forces behind Bitcoin at the beginning. So we're now seeing it move, this, this cutting out the middleman move from just trading money to a variety of financial services. Yeah. And what about Dogecoin that uh, Musk tweeted about? It's oh, cool. To have some on Dogecoin. You should. Have, you can get some. It's still very cheap. Um, it may go to a dollar. That's what the market's trying to do. Um, Dogecoin is very, very interesting because while it's kind of crazy, it's probably the closest cryptocurrency to Bitcoin on the market because there's no corporation behind it. There's no entity. There's no company. Um, Bitcoin is truly in the hands of the public, and Dogecoin is also truly in the hands of the public. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But hey, remember the Jamaica bobsled team? They <laughs> to, to was it the the Winter Olympics based on yep. uh, Dogecoin donations back in the day? So Jamaica has a connection to Dogecoin. That's been mm -hmm. around for so long. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Oh, this is this is the more recent Winter Olympics team. I'm uh, thinking about, oh, this thinking was, about uh, uh, cool yeah. running. <laughs> it's yeah. not, not the cool running team. <laughs> more recent than that. Yep, that was it. The Jamaica that was the, it. Bitcoin is like the second cryptocurrency or third that emerged on the market. You know, it was created as a joke, but people it got a value because Bitcoin had a value, and they sent us to the Olympics. So, you know, <laughs> it's got some coolness there. Earl, what are some other popular ones that you're familiar with? Well, I am not too um, pro going below what we see as the top 10. Um, I, I think Carson said something earlier there, which um, I'm going to sort of flip the switch on, um, that the banks are adopting blockchain extremely um, fast. And therefore, being able to sort of have the institutions come in and buy it stimulates the market. But what I like is companies who do things called SDOs. And I come from the ICO days where, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, where there was something called shit coins, but they're still around. Yeah. And these guys have multiplying value. And when you look at their website and what their business is all about, you kind of go, how is this going to grow? Like, uh, like, I don't understand. So I'm more or less looking at those that provide services, efficiencies, changing the landscape, which is what crypto is doing in terms of barter exchange and value exchange. True so value. true value. And uh, his peer-to-peer -peer comment, Carson's peer-to-peer -peer comments associated with like um, Ethereum and what they're doing is just brilliant because this could save the banks billions of dollars in terms of you know fraud and everything else associated. So let's not only look at these cryptos, let's look at what the crypto stands for, what's behind it, and see the value. Then you can pick what you want to invest in, just like any other stock. Yeah. Yeah. So, so um, Earl made an excellent point, um, Kilila, because so in addition to looking at the cryptocurrencies and you asked earlier, how do I know which one there's so much out there? Mm -hmm. And if you kind of relate it to the, the stock market, it's it's about being able, so we know the two, two main ones or the two top ones, which are the Bitcoin and the Ethereum. So it's all about the investment approach that you're looking to take. If it is that you're more of a long-term buy and hold investor, I totally agree with Horn that says um, you should see these prices explode over the, another three, four years. If you're more of a day trader where the speculation you can get burned, you can also gain, but there's a lot of volatility there. But it's about selecting what you know and what you understand. It's kind of the same message that you preach on your program that whatever you're investing in is to get the understanding. So most persons tend to follow and understand what Bitcoin is all about, what Ethereum being a smart contract, and those are the main, main two. 
and they definitely have not reached their top, in, in my personal opinion. Mm -hmm. But another opportunity that this market brings to the table is the whole STO, Securitized Token, token Offering, which is pretty much replicating the traditional market of an IPO. So these companies that are looking to raise funds are able to come to the market in the form of um, token offering and to raise it. And the beauty about it is that it's, it's, beyond the, it's beyond the borders in which you are doing this raise. And I think that, that is really revolutionary um, for the whole cryptocurrency market to bring, to, to bring this to the fore. Mm. Good point. Very very, so the very very one of the things we've been doing for the past few years is we are pretty much like a small version of coin market cap right we got over five thousand coins we have all the icos we have all the um DeFi listings all the exchanges all the market data and um one pretty cool thing is you know running this kind of operation we kind of see a lot of the trends we can monitor trends across different market segments but the other one which we get, which is very cool, is we actually see what people who come to the site are looking for. So, you know, when we see um, a lot of interest on the site peaking around a specific coin, usually this means that there's something is happening around this coin, right? So it gives us powerful data that we can use to trade ourselves, right? So yeah. the, the power of the data in this market, um, new emerging markets are like NFTs. I think NFTs, which are crypto assets, versions of art, they sold $2 billion in the first quarter of this yes. year. Yes. I actually oh. want to do another show on NFTs because that's yes. another very hot topic right now. And it is. That's where I first became introduced to Earl in a discussion about NFTs. So we have to do a part two uh, concerning NFTs. But but Karsten, you said uh, you have a lot of data that you get when you see people what people are searching for on your site. Yeah. So what are, what are the hot coins there on Caricoin that people are interested in? <laughs> Uh, good question. I heard him say that, and I was hoping you'd ask that. <laughs> yeah, give us some, some data insights, Karsten. I'll tell you what's really hot right now is DeFi. So DeFi, which is the um, peer-to-peer -peer loans, right? So DeFi services allow... Are you spell that? DEFI, it's decentralized finance. Mm -hmm. so it basically allows for loans on the blockchain. So if I have one Bitcoin and I want to borrow one Bitcoin, I can basically put my Bitcoin up and borrow against it. And this it's is like a margin. Mm -hmm. It's done without a middleman. It's done with a margin. The margins are usually two to three percent, right? So I can actually lend you money against your Bitcoin, but me personally. And it's done in a manner where um, I, if you have to pay me back. If you don't pay me back, I basically get your assets. So there's no risk for the lender. Um, when the market's going up, it's great for, for borrowers because you know, you could borrow 10 Bitcoin against 10 Bitcoin, invest it in the market, cash it out in three months and, and make a margin. So this has been blowing up and um, they're powered by DeFi tokens, which allow mm -hmm. people to cross trade. So um, Uniswap, PancakeSwap, these guys are growing along with this market, but it's pretty cool because the market for, for swaps and for loans is what's building the value of these tokens. It's clear, you can see it, right? Other things yeah. like Dogecoin, Dogecoin is growing based on coolness, right? So um, it's a hard one to follow, but DeFi is growing. And even not the NFTs, which people don't, most people don't understand, but there's tokens people use to also trade NFTs. So I can use a token to buy digital art. So these tokens are also blowing up as the NFT market blows up. So I think those are the two hot ones right there. Mm -hmm. So Karsten, can I still get that free Bitcoin? <laughs> so we, we, can, we can help you we're, we launched the, the first the ship has sailed, huh? yeah. <laughs> but we can actually give you um a, a reggae nft a song it's the first reggae song done as an nft that we launched in partnership with um with basie from tok right uh, i saw that in the paper so i have one of those which i could give you if you use, if you give it some promotion <laughs> all right let's, let, let's look into it and we do need to have a part two about nfts thank you guys so much for joining me I really enjoyed this discussion denise i'll be with you on wednesday 
uh, for your seminar, VM Wealth, talking about this very issue. So for those of you watching who are interested in more information, check out VM Wealth's seminar at, uh, what time does it start on Wednesday, Denise? It starts at 5. Yeah. 5, yes, it starts at 5. Awesome stuff. Thank you guys so much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Nice Thank you. Up next, we've got your market recap and the analysts are standing by. This segment of Taking Stock was brought to you by Bulwark Insurance Agency, Insurance Made Easy, and Massey United Insurance. How good is your insurance? Time now for your market recap, brought to you by Sagicor Investments. Think wealth, think Sagicor Investments. The Jamaica Stock Exchange advanced with the combined index gaining 1%. 107 stocks traded across both the main and junior markets of the JSC for the week ending Friday, April 30, 2021. 55 advanced, 44 declined, and 8 stayed the same. Nearly 174 million shares changed hands on the Jamaican dollar market, totaling $856 million. Future energy source company Ordinary Fesco traded the most taking up nearly 33% of the market. The stock lost $0.03 cents to open the week at $1.02. Main event entertainment group traded the second highest, with people buying and selling nearly 31 million shares in the company. We reckon that was mainly the transaction with Supreme Ventures, which has acquired 10% of main event. Main event has about 300 million shares in total, so 30 million is just about 10%. The stock lost 98 cents to open the week at $3.51. And Wigton Wind Farm Ordinary Shares rounded out the most traded, taking up 5% of market volume. The stock gained 1 cent to open the week at 64 cents. Now let's see who had the biggest gains. Cygnus Credit Investments Jamaican Dollar Ordinary Shares stock price rose 24% to close last week at 15 cents. Fosrich Company stock price rose nearly 23% to be second for this week's biggest gains. Fosrich was also the month's biggest gainer. The stock opens this new month May at $7.17. And rounding off the biggest gains, Victoria Mutual Investments Ordinary Shares stock advanced nearly 21% to open this week at $7.15. On the losing side now, Margaritaville Turks was the biggest loser for the week, down nearly 26%. The stock was also the biggest loser for the month of April, down to $20.86. Iron Rock Insurance Company was second on the list, its stock price down at nearly 25% this week. Iron Rock was also April's third biggest loser to open this new month at $3.02. Rounding off the biggest losers, KLE Group lost 24% last week, down to $1.05. Now here's a quick look at some of the other highlights of the month of April. The main index advanced by 3%. The junior market advanced by nearly 7%. The financial index advanced by nearly 1%. After closing both locations in March, Palace Amusement came second among the biggest gains. It's stock up by nearly 40% to close April at $900.40. Rounding off the biggest gains for the month of April, Jamaica Producers Group stock advanced nearly 35% to open this new month at $27.92. Margaritaville Turk's US dollar was the second biggest loser. Its stock price down 27% to close April at $0.08 cents US. Market recap was brought to you by Sagicor Investments. Think wealth. Think Sagicor Investments. This segment of Taking Stock, The Analysts, is brought to you by Jamaica Money Market Brokers and Proven Wealth. Welcome back to Taking Stock. I've got a team of analysts to examine the week in business. I'm joined by investment analyst at Proven Wealth, Julian Marson, and business writer at the Jamaica Observer, David Rose. We're also expected to be joined by Assistant General Manager of Trading and Treasury at JMMB, Greg Lindo. Hi, David. Hi, Julia, and welcome back. Hey, Kalila. Morning, morning Kalila. And we're there. hoping that we're hoping that Greg from JMMB can join us and give us give us his input as well. I want to canvas both of your opinions on a very hot topic right now, and that is investing in cryptocurrency. That's what we're talking about in the first segment of this program. What are your thoughts, Julian, on investing in cryptocurrencies? So some people are still afraid of it. There's risk, but it's exploded over the past year. Okay, so 
on the face of it, cryptocurrency has again become a hot topic. But there's an argument that there aren't any fundamentals behind cryptocurrency. But what makes cryptocurrency unique in is that they have an underlying technology, which is a blockchain. And there are applications that are sometimes built on top of these blockchain um, frameworks. So for instance, there's the Ethereum framework um, tied to Ether. And there are many other technologies that are going to be developed from the Ethereum um, blockchain. So for instance, HTTP, which is um, what we use to access the World Wide Web, it's actually a protocol. So what we're saying is that there are many other technological um, tools and, and, and infrastructures that are going to rely on the protocol tied to Ethereum. So it means that because of the technology that is there, it will open the way for new applications that don't exist currently. Um, there's another one called Cardano. There's another one called Chainlink. Those are technologies that actually have use case, meaning that there are useful applications that are being built on top of them. However, there are cryptocurrencies that don't have applications be being built on top of their technology, such as the Dogecoin is actually a meme. It was created as a joke. So just because Ethereum increased 13% in a week and Dogecoin increased 100% in a week doesn't mean that Dogecoin is better than Ethereum. The key is to look at the underlying technology and how the underlying technology is going to be used in the future, which is what secures the underlying value of these cryptocurrencies. So it's more of a technology argument as opposed to looking at it just because the price is running up quickly. Mm. Um, yeah, pretty well, much. That's, that's, that's a very, yeah. use, very useful assessment, Julian. Yes, David? And we've also seen right now the rising NFTs, non-fungible tokens, which is, you know, uh, purchasing this interest in the original item or, or, or piece. So the other day we saw Jack Dorsey, the CEO of Twitter, actually. Okay, uh, before you go into Jack Dorsey, explain what an NFT is. So from my relatively nascent understanding, because it's also new, a non fungible mm -hmm. token is basically uh, tied through, I believe it's the Ether network, to specifically some original digital piece. So, like, you know, probably like I don't have more than this in Paris, you are getting something that's saying you are the original owner. There isn't any duplication saying, you know, oh, somebody else owns it or whatever, or somebody creates a fake certificate or whatever else. It's something that's very unique, specific to that item which is being sold. So Jack Dorsey, which is the CEO of Twitter, sold the NFT or the rights to his first tweet, or the first to be on Twitter. And that's more like more than two million US dollars. And he's missing a lot of crazy spends by people on just, you know, all of the digital things, you know. Even the picture of the girl, me of the girl looking behind, and there's a fire in front, that mean picture. So for like five hundred thousand US dollars recently. And you have you've just been seeing all of these different uh, applications of the blockchain and overall cryptography, cryptographic environment, meaning we're using technology more and more to eliminate the levels of fraud and create more, you know, genuine ownership interest. Because imagine if you're able to use an NFT, for example, with, say, land titles, it would process way, way faster. Instead of somebody that would take actual physical document down to the actual office, you probably store that, store that title's office, for example, and you have an NFT that says, hey, I'm the original owner. So crypto, uh, cryptocurrency, NFTs, all these digital things that you're seeing towards ownership is technically democratizing, or in one sense, creating more transparency in overall framework because we've seen stories about, you know, somebody has been told this is land is this person's own, shown documentation, and turns out mm -hmm. it wasn't theirs. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we're seeing, so, you know, all I these different the tools are supporting environment. I recently purchased a piece of digital art from a Jamaican artist, and it was, it's actually a print of the digital creation. And he gave me a certificate of authenticity, and that ties into, we were having a discussion about it, into the whole NFT thing, which is something that he's looking into as a possibility for his own art. I see Greg is now joining us. Hi, Greg. Hi, Kalila. Um, 
apologies for my late um, attendance. That's okay. So we're talking about uh, cryptocurrency and the whole rage over the past year surrounding mm -hmm. cryptocurrency, because that was the main discussion uh, in this week's uh, show. And I'm canvassing you guys' opinions on it. Do you think cryptocurrency is a good investment right now, Greg? If you if you have the risk tolerance for it, um, it it's highly speculative. Um, certainly, you have a range of opinions on cryptocurrency, whether it's going to be mass adopted or if it's just um, you know something that it's a good trading opportunity because you have very very wide um, price movements. So I, I think time will tell. Uh, a number of persons I know have looked into it. It's it's not necessarily the easiest thing to get into in terms of um, you know setting up and funding your account from what I understand. But, you know, certainly if you have the risk tolerance and I mean, if it's an asset class that you want to take a try at, then just understand that it is extremely volatile. Um, and, you know, it has potential for you to gain, it has potential for you to lose. Although I'm sure the persons that bought Bitcoin many years ago are like multi-millionaires and more. Yeah. So they're probably going to say, well, you know, I did well, but you never know. And I mean, there is a lot of talk about, you know, central banks possibly, you know, putting restrictions on it and how cryptocurrencies can interfere with um, fiat currency monetary systems. So if if that starts to happen, then maybe you might see a very fast shift in terms of how people trade it when you realize, all right, I might be stuck in an asset that I can't effectively monetize. So um, there are a lot of questions that are to be, you know, answered, and I think um, conversations around cryptocurrencies will continue to grow, um, and then we'll, we'll kind of see where it goes from there. Yeah, I, I know those are our legitimate concerns as well. But what, one of the things that was noted in the previous conversation is that one of the reasons for the surge in Bitcoin value over the past year is that a lot of institutional investors have now come on board. And so I think they said some 30 percent of Bitcoin is owned by banks. You know, it's owned by the big guys. So when you see the, the institutional investors jumping on board, the small guy tends to take their cues. Uh, David, you had also mentioned, uh, before, I nearly said during the break, we don't really have commercial breaks, but before we started recording, that there, I think both of you, you and Julian were making this point, that there is a shortage of, uh, of assets to invest Asset in here in the Caribbean. The Caribbean. Yeah, Julian, you were the one who raised that. So do you think cryptocurrency is a good uh assets since there is this this shortage well as greg rightly mentioned it should be contextualized by risk tolerance because for instance many people might say well this cryptocurrency performed x amount performed by x amount in a specific time frame versus the equity market but here's the thing these markets aren't as comparable as one would think because for instance a re an equity market is regulated it has circuit breakers etc while that is not the case for the cryptocurrency space, that's not to say it's necessarily a bad thing, but it's all about risk and return and understanding what we can tolerate. Because the fact is, Jamaicans are aggressive until they start losing money. They like to talk mm -hmm. about the fact that they're aggressive investors, but when they start seeing their US dollars decline, mm -hmm. it's a different story. So everybody is this big hero and this big champion and a big bad wolf until the money starts to decline. So mm -hmm. it's just a matter of putting the opportunity into context and knowing the technology behind it to understand the sustainability of the gains. Because a lot of it is just noise. Um, for instance, I gave the Dogecoin example. I mean, it's just a meme. So how sustainable would a price um, increase be when people stop pumping it? You know, a lot of it is pump and dump that that. That's also the reality of it. Are you buying at the top? Are you being caught with the bag at the end of the day? So we we'll have to put these things into the equation as well. Good points, good points. Um, all right. And one thing that you realized even with last year was that based on all of this money printing support, the stimulus money last year, as person trying to find alternative assets because you have a quick liquidity in the system as well. The US printing more than a third of its money supply. So that was another argument persons were saying that with fiat, Anything that anything goes because US printed a third of its uh, money supply last year, and people are saying my money is in, of course, I've got money 
fiat is getting less and it's valuable as more money is printed. So right. there was an argument that's being posited as well. Right, right, right. There were fears about inflation rising because of all that money that was being printed. What are your observations of the market this past week? Well, we've noticed that the JSE indices, so both the main and the junior market for the most part, have actually been responding to some of the earnings that have come out. Uh, what jumps out recently is the fact that Carib Cement had earnings that just blew everybody away. Clearly, we would have heard preliminary discussions around the real estate boom, the fact that there's a construction boom, and this would have fed into Carib Cement's earnings. But if we look at it across the board, it's not just revenues and profits. Their operating cash flows are up. That means that they've been managing their inventory very well, and it shows that management has really been aggressive in making the company into one that can fully take advantage of what's happening. Debt is also down, which is great. Again, it speaks to management, so they're doing very well. Uh, we anticipate other companies to come to the fore and um, outshine what they did in 2020, given that 2020 was a rough year. But investors, again, they have been taking initiative, going ahead. They're on the buy side. We notice that the index has been responding to this. So we want to see further growth in coming quarters, and everything is pointing in that direction so far. Mm -hmm. We see some news about Grace Kennedy this week as well. In the past week, Caracris has given them high ratings. What do you think accounts for that, David? Why are they doing so well? Well, we can see it just from Grace Kennedy's diverse operations. So when Grace Kennedy does uh, food trading, banking and investments, insurance and money services, and Grace Kennedy has just been on a continuous strong performance for the last couple of years. And last year was just the culmination of all of that work. So remember, Grace Candy posted, I think it was 30% gross net profit to $6.9 billion. And you know, they said they established a mergers and acquisitions unit to allow for them to take proper advantage of what's going on in the environment. So we saw them, you know, say they're going to acquire Scotia Caribbean, Eastern Caribbean Insurance, and they're going to acquire the A76 brand, Water Brand. And those are just some of the acquisitions they've talked about. Uh, Grace Candy acquired the majority interest in key insurance last year, and they said there was another 10 deals in the pipeline right now. So that Caracris debt raise 3.3 billion Jamaican dollars is to facilitate Grace Kennedy's, you know, most recent acquisitions. It was actually disclosed by uh, the CEO, Don Webby. So we can kind of get a ballpark idea as to what the cost of those, of especially this Porsche acquisition is actually be, be right now. So Grace Kennedy taking on this debt didn't surprise me because I didn't know 2020 G cared about as a company, not the overall group, but specifically just the company itself at about $5 billion of cash. And as a company, you're not going to take on your own resources to hold some acquisition. They're going to, you know, probably do some debt and equity. Grace Candy says, you know, 70% debt, 30% equity. So works in Grace Candy right now is nothing surprising. And I shouldn't turn it into a very successful environment because Tourism is still down, so now like persons are coming out of Jamaica to you know give the money directly in hand to persons who might have needed it to take care of themselves. So the monetary business is still having a great time right now. Retences are still up based on BOJ data. Uh, for food trading, everybody's still at home, and people are still consuming a good amount of food. And with the recent lockdowns that we've been experiencing in Jamaica, it's even it's actually saying it's better, but it's still showing that you're going to see more food consumption that division and you know banking investments and insurance are performing well and you know he recently the, the rest issue sold up a property uh transfer some of the losses in the portfolio so you're going to see some great results this year for grace kennedy and just this bond raise is probably just the first of probably more debt raises later in the year so greg i see guardian and uh, david you alerted us to this a few weeks ago but I see they've now made it official. They've sent a letter saying, stating their intention to list by introduction. Greg, what do you make of that development? Uh, well, it's interesting. Um, you know, prior to, I guess, recent news, you know, Guardian was listed on the market. Um, during a different time, uh, I was delisted largely because of, you know, lack of activity, which... It's, it's not uncommon, you know, um, for a lot of cross, some of the cross-listing stocks, right? But, you know, given the, the the performance of Guardian in recent recent times, 
certainly it's an opportunity for them to, I guess, open up a company to more shareholders. It also, they're trying to provide more liquidity um, to the current shareholders that own, own the stock. So it's interesting because, I mean, Guardian, it trades at a, if you look at it from a trailing, it's pretty cheap. It's cheaper than anything. Um, which is their their parent, right? Um, but it's gonna it, it will probably be crossed with, with a stock price in the region of maybe five hundred and fifty dollars. So it's interesting to see how our market will um, adjust to that. You know, if you if you look at how the mark our market is, you know, with the, the retail investors particularly tend to have a affinity for the stocks that are listed at low nominal prices. So it would be interesting to see what happens once that cross system takes effect, which I anticipate should be any no, and how the market is going to respond. Because if you look at the cross listed stocks between Trinidad and Jamaica, the prices in Trinidad all tend to trade at high premiums, at least if you use the official uh, central bank exchange rates. JMMB, Grace, NCB, um, and GHL. All have um, pre well, except GHL have premium prices when you look at the Jamaican current listing, right? So will GHL conform to that? And what does that mean? Does it mean that price in Trinidad might probably go up because persons kind of see it as an avenue that they can buy the stock in Trinidad and sell it in Jamaica to access foreign currency? Because that's uh, that's something that we've seen quite regularly over over the past couple. Of couple of years because it's, it's extremely difficult to access US dollars um, in terms of converting TT to US dollars. There is US dollars in the TT market, don't get me wrong. You can move US dollars, it's just converting it from TT to US dollars is a problem. So you know, it'll be interesting to see how that phenomenon plays out on the stock price of GHL in both Trinidad and Jamaica. Yeah, Greg and Julian, are you guys seeing any early interest in GHL from Jamaican investors. Uh, what's the what's the temperature like for when this does list? Well, personally, I haven't heard much talk about it, but that could change once it actually lists because the financials are now on the, the stock exchange website. So that could change in in short order, maybe in two quarters time when people get more familiar and they start seeing it and they're hearing and they start more. I'm actually looking to actually open an account in Trinidad with JMB. Uh, yes, so JMB Jamaica also has a subsidiary in Trinidad which has its investments. They're actually a broker down there. Uh, so, you know, I'm looking to open an account down there to acquire GHL down there as well because, as Julian rightfully mentioned, sorry, Greg rightfully mentioned, there's a, as you would say, a premium in Trinidad versus Jamaica. But what's my, what might be the case is you probably might see GHL raise equity here in Jamaica. and you probably might see potentially that stock splits make it more conformity to nominal investors. We don't know, but at the same time, you're just trying to peak you around seven or eight times. And we have to remember that GHL through GDL, GLL, which is Grand Life Limited here in Jamaica, acquired NCB insurance companies' insurance portfolio. And based on NCB FG's uh, financials, which were released yes, well, on Thursday, Guidance did a very strong quarter. Apart from commission estimates is rising, from operating standpoint, operating profit standpoint, they basically doubled their profit, their results in terms of operating profits for both general insurance and, uh, and life and health and premium. So life and health did 11 billion over the six months compared to the 4 billion in the prior year, and health, general insurance did 4 billion versus 2 billion in the prior year. And we have to remember that NCV insurance doesn't only does fund management now. So that's really and truly just GLL overall showing its current results. So we'll see what's interesting what happens in the coming weeks. Well, it should list by May 5, based on the JSC's rules, which is within 14 days. But we're going to see what's going to happen because I come and listen to JSE, opens the opportunity for them to do an APO, a rest issue, whatever they want to do. And NTV comes Capital Markets has said, they're going to make a market for it. So you probably might see the pension funds and so on, take interest into Guardian because it just is an NCB subsidiary, relatively undervalued, and this even our asset manager I'm is planning to open back up into the Caribbean right now. So we just have to watch and see what happens. But NCB is going to open a great opportunity for them as well. 
All right, Julian, let's wrap by looking at the international markets. Last time you were on, I kind of laughed at you with Crocs, but you were right on the money, it turned out. This time you're looking at Procter & Gamble. Why? Okay, I know you weren't laughing at me with Crocs money. This didn't see <laughs> coming. All right, so Procter & Gamble, they posted their nine months results, um, which ends in March. Um, so they're trading at around $133.04 uh, on the New York Stock Exchange. In terms of their earnings so far uh, for the nine month period, it's up 11.5% to $11.4 billion. Um, that's guided by sales that increased 7.4% to $54.17 billion. Um, for context though, their expenses crept up, but just um, by modest amount by 4.7% year over year to $15.41 billion. Um, in terms of their operating cash flow, however, that's up 13% to 14 billion. So we're not just seeing earnings growing in terms of fluff, we're actually seeing the cash flow growing by a greater amount, slightly greater amount to back that. So that shows quality of earnings, which is very important. Um, in terms of what guided this performance though, we're seeing where the fabric and home care sector leading the growth, and then that's followed by the beauty segment, then the baby, and the family care segment. And what is important is that we didn't just see a superstar performance from one segment. We saw a fairly healthy distribution of growth year over year across the multiple segments in the business, which is also a good sign. The total debt is down 17% year over year. And right now it looks very attractive. The company has Pampers in its portfolio. They have Downey, Tide, Gillette, Vicks. Remember Robopia Vicks, every Jamaican knows that and Pepto Bismol. So it's a strong business, strong portfolio. They've done exceptionally well so far for the nine months. The next quarter should be good or be equal, given that consumer spending is up and savings are very high because of the stimulus payments. Um, again, the stock is about 133.4 cents. Um, the dividend yield is about 2.4%. The PE is about 24.5 times, which is not bad for what it is in terms of the operating performance and the financial performance on a whole. So it seems fair. And it's down 10.43% from its 52-week high. So it's worth looking at. All right. Thank you guys for your input. Much appreciated as usual. You're welcome, All right, Kalilo. Thank you. Bye, guys. This segment of Taking Stock, The Analysts, was brought to you by Jamaica Money Market Brokers and Proven Wealth. That's our show for this week. Thanks for watching. Make sure you like this video, subscribe to this channel and share with a friend. Also subscribe to our newsletter at kalilorunnels.com and turn on those post notifications so that you can be the first to see all my other features. We want to help people learn more about money so we can all get this money together. So this week on Money Mondays JA, I'll share some things to consider when picking stocks. On Money Moves, JA Honey Bun Foundation's new Gap app can help you spot the weaknesses in your business and take steps to fix them. And what's in it for me is back this week. We're looking at the Bank of Jamaica's independence. What does it mean? And of course, what's in it for me? Follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Kalila Ray and follow at Taking Stock JA on Instagram. If you want to connect with the analysts this week, check the description box below for their contact information. Also visit our website, kalilareynolds.com for financial information you can use however you like it, watch, listen, or read. Now tell a friend about taking stock. Investing is the news, sexy. So let's make it cool to talk about money. I'm Kalila Reynolds. Stay safe. Let's get this money. <laughs> <laughs>